and preach the gospel. So make some noise for Andy Hawthorne as he comes in Jesus' name. Thanks, Seth. Um, evening, everybody. So it's lovely to be here and uh, appreciate that introduction. Absolutely 100% agree with Seth. We cannot keep this good news to ourselves. It is wrong that we are having so much fun in the churches and a lot of the world hasn't got a clue about it. Isn't that right? One of the things we are doing is the Eden Network, planting out churches into the toughest communities. Started in Manchester. Much of our work is still in Manchester, but we now have a, a, a trust here in London and six what we call Eden teams living long term, seeing transformation come. We could literally do a new Eden church plant every month if God would just send the workers, and that's you. If you like the sound of what Seth just said, and you're like, oh, well, that's what I want to do. I want to live missionally. I want to live in community. I want to tr see transformation come as the kingdom of God comes. We would love to talk to you. So at the speaker's contact stand, you can find more information about Eden. If you put Eden Network in Google, uh, we won't send you a, a, um, a keys to a property in the inner city tomorrow, but we could start a process, and you could move in with a team to a deprived community. We'd love to speak to you about that. Um, I, yeah, until a week ago, I was going to speak on something completely different uh, tonight. But I, God's been on my case. And he's been on my case about one thing. And, and one thing in particular. Really for the last month, I think. But particularly the last week, I've been ministering at another conference. And God's been talking to me about the Father's heart. Now, we have a, a fatherless generation growing up in the UK. You know that, don't you? So many fathers have uh, abandoned their kids, and even the ones that stay behind, many of them are acting appallingly, acting appalling towards their kids. At the Message Trust in Manchester, we have little times of worship and praise every morning. And we had, a, a, about a month ago, a sweet guy called Johnny, who uh, does all our websites, was leading worship. And he, uh, he started singing Father's Song. I don't know if you know that song, written by a friend of mine, Matt Redman. But I know... You see that Matt Redman's father was an appalling father. He abused him. He ended up going to prison because of the terrible way he treated his son. I'm not telling you any secret. Matt's testified to this publicly. But he's able to write 15 years fast forward. Matt Redman comes to Jesus and he's able to write this beautiful song. The father's song. Because of Jesus. Because of the transformation that's come. But all around me in our prayer time, you see we work a lot as Seth said in the prisons in the northwest and we provide jobs and homes and supportive church for all these guys who are coming to Christ in prison so all around me are these guys and every single one of them either their father had left or their father had abused and neglected them and that was the starting point towards their terrible behavior and yet Jesus steps in and everything says that you know the abused becomes the abuser that's the way the devil wants to do it. But actually for these people in this room, and so I'm like super moved in this worship time. And, I'm, and I downloaded that song onto my phone. And I must have played it about 40 times in my car. The Father's Song. By this young man who could sing this beautiful song about the Father singing over him for eternity. And how much he loves the Father and experiences the Father's love. And I went home and... You know, one of the things that um, I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed about is, is how little I cry. I know as a man of God, you're meant to be able to open up the waterworks. You know, I didn't even cry when Manchester United didn't qualify for the Champions League. And uh, I went home, and my daughter's going out on mission to Mozambique with Heidi Baker, the poorest country on earth, and, and she's doing all this, tr saving up all her money. She's working this summer so she can go out in October to be a missionary with Heidi Baker. And then she said to me, my daughter said to me, um, and you know, I can't go out with this guy. I, I, I'm really quite sweet on this guy, but I don't think it's right because I've got this missionary call on my life. And you know what happened to me? I started crying my eyes out. I mean, not like little moist, but proper, you know, the thing Mancunians don't do. I mean, I'm bawling my eyes out. And best like, what's the matter, Dad? I'm like, I just love you, girl. But it wasn't my father's love. I was experiencing and feeling some of the father's love towards this daughter of his. 
Your greatest need tonight is to experience the Father's love, to know you're loved by Father God. Whatever your earthly father was like, and everything else you need will spill out of that. It's interesting, isn't it? In Luke chapter 11, one of Jesus' disciples asks him a, a fascinating question. You know, Lord, will you teach us to pray? They'd seen something about Jesus' prayer life that had just blown their mind. He was passionate. He was personal. He wasn't some boring religious going through the motions. And when Jesus prayed, stuff happened. You know, like dead people coming to life. And like blind eyes seeing. And lame people walking. And people discovering the Father for themselves. So this disciple says to Jesus, Jesus, teach us to pray like you pray. And you know what Jesus said? And he says it to all of us in the old court arena tonight. He says, when you pray, say, Father. 2,000 years ago, it was an outrageous thing to say. Even today, in many ways, it's an outrageous thing to say. Because what Jesus said, you probably know. He says, when you pray, pray Abba. Pray Dad. Pray to your personal Dad. And every time Jesus prayed, we've got 26 prayers of Jesus in the New Testament, in the Gospels. Every single time he prayed, he prayed Abba, Dad. Jesus had this incredible relationship with his father. And, and the Jewish people, you know, they, they wouldn't even say the name of God. They wouldn't even let the name pass their lips. He was so holy. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray dad. And, he's, and there's one time when Jesus didn't pray dad. Only, the only prayer we've got in the gospels when Jesus didn't pray dad. And that was when he hung on a cross. When Jesus hung on a cross taking the punishment for every wrong thing we've ever done. When he died on the cross for us, Jesus didn't pray, Dad, that one time. He prayed, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? And the sky went black for three hours. And Jesus was punished on that cross for every wrong thing, every person, not just in the Earl's Court arena, but every person who's ever lived. He took the full wrath of God on himself on the cross. And he couldn't pray, Father, because the relationship with his father, with his dad, was separated. You know why, that, why the relationship with Jesus and the father was separated? So that you can call him father. A lot of people talk. I mean, is anybody excited about this stuff? You see, people talk about the fatherhood of all believers. What all God's children. Well, that ain't in my Bible, you know. The only people who can call God Father are those who have been made children of God, adopted into his family by Christ. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, you can be a son or a daughter of God. You can be adopted. You can be co-heirs with Christ. You can receive all the benefits of being a follower of Jesus. It's amazing. And it can happen to people tonight for the first time. If you'll surrender to Jesus and have everything removed that's stopping you being a child of God, all the rubbish, all the sin, all the stuff that Jesus was punished for, you don't automatically become a child of God. You have to choose to be adopted into that family. I want to show you a picture. I hope this will come up. This is my mate, Nick Shalavi. Is that going to come up, that picture? Anyway, let me tell you about him if we can find it. A picture of my friend Nick. And Nick... Uh, for some reason, when Nick was 13 years old, God put him on my heart. And uh, I don't know why, I just felt like I wanted to chase round after this guy. So every Sunday, every Saturday night, I'd be out speaking. I'd be picking Nick up. And he must have heard me preach the gospel 50 times. And yet, never accepted Christ. And as I chased him round and prayed with him and tried to help him, Nick went, Nick's life, inevitably his father had left him and treated appallingly towards him. And Nick's life spiraled out of control. He got heavily into drugs. Then he went into all sorts of violent gang activity. He was nearly murdered. He was violent, angry young man dealing drugs. And all the time, for some reason, I'm chasing Nick round Manchester. And then annoyingly, somebody else takes him to a meeting like this. And a Nigerian pastor came up and said, there's somebody in this place you call Nick. And you've been turning away from God and you're dealing drugs. You're into crime and violence. The guy knew nothing about Nick's life. Didn't even know Nick was there. It was only a little church meeting. 
And Nick came to the front in tears and surrendered his life to Christ. And he came back and told me he was a changed man. But during all that chaos, he got into a relationship with a girl called Andrea. And they were living together. Their relationship was very dysfunctional, very violent. When uh, Andrea first heard that Nick had become a Christian, she tore up his Bible. But eventually the message managed to get Andrea out to Uganda on a mission trip. And she saw miracles. She saw incredible things happen and she gave her life to Christ. And a couple of years ago, this is what happened. This is Nick and Andrea's wedding. I was able to be the best man at their wedding. And it was a beautiful thing. And uh, they had a little girl called Alexis. Alexis almost certainly would have been, you know, another victory for the devil. Another one. Have we got that picture of the wedding? Maybe we have. Anyway, and she was, she was brought up in this angry, violent household. The mum and dad weren't married to each other. They were in and out of relationships. They were a mess. And there it is. It's a beautiful day when they got married. And Nick has become this raving evangelist soul winner. He works full time for the, for the message. He's in the prisons winning people for Jesus. Almost certainly, Seth knows this guy. Almost certainly this weekend that guy will win hundreds of people for Christ. It's a beautiful thing. But the reason I tell you that is because after they got married, they had this little girl called Alexis suddenly being brought up in the Lord, in the church and loving Jesus. And then Nick had a second child six months ago called Nico. And uh, Nick came round my house, uh, 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 well, six months ago when Nico was born, late on a Sunday night, knocking on my door. I'm like, okay, mate, you all right? He said, uh, yeah, 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 I'm, I'm okay. Uh, I, I just had to come round, Andy. I've been driving around Manchester singing. I'm so excited about little Nico, and I, I feel God's love for him, and this young boy who's going to be brought up in this family, in the Lord, and he's so amazing, and I just, I can't, I can't, I've got to share it with someone who'll understand. And then he said this. This is what did me. He said, and when Alexis was born, that was his daughter, two years previous when he wasn't a Christian, I was an idiot. I was in and out of the delivery suite. I was taking drugs. I was hanging around with all my old mates, and I never enjoyed it. I couldn't experience any of these feelings that I'm meant to feel. You see, I've heard a bishop say the best time to reach a man for God is after the birth of his first child. Well, Nico was like the birth of his first child for Nick because God was ordering things the way they're meant to be. He was giving him his father heart. I just want to show you a picture of one other person quickly. A great friend of mine called Tori. And I love this picture because she's so beautiful. But the first time I met Tori, again, her husband had come to Christ through the message. And he was a drug dealer. DJ, crazy guy, but he came to Christ big sad, and she was a goth, very, very angry, one of the most angry young women I've ever met, and her face was dark, and she, again, she'd been horribly sexually abused by her father, and she, again, she's written a book about it called Our Little Secret, and then, um, and Tori, I, I, I prayed for her when she led her, when we led her to Christ, it was about 10 years ago now, and physically, I mean, I've never seen this so dramatic, Physically, she was transformed. I had to do a double take. Five minutes previous, this was a different face. It was like the same person, but renewed, saved, freed. And a journey started of forgiveness towards her father. And she's now able to say her father's forgiven. And I'm free in the name of Jesus. And I can be the mother I'm meant to be to my two beautiful girls. Don't you love what Jesus does? If you struggle calling God Father because your father's been lousy, can I just say to you a little tip? Look to Jesus. Because Jesus said, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. He said, me and the Father are one. Your Father loves you. He loves you as if you were the only person he'd ever made. He would have sent his son to die for you if you were the only person who'd ever lived. Now, I, I hate I hate the devil. I hate what he does. He wants you to think you're not loved by God. I promise you, you're loved by God. Your father doesn't just love you. The father believes in you. He believes in you. The day you were saved, you got two wonderful gifts. If you're saved, you got the gift of salvation, but... The Lord also gave you the gift of good work, a life of good work mapped out for you. 
and he resourced you with his Holy Spirit. He breathed on you and said, receive my spirit. Come into the family. Become co-heirs with Jesus. And God doesn't just love you. Check this out. God loves you as much as he loves Jesus. How amazing is that? That's what Jesus said. Help them to know, John 17, that you love them even as you've loved me. Is anybody blown away by that? Anybody amazed by that? And God resources you. One story that I'm done, and I'm going to ask you to stand on your feet. If you want to truly receive the love of the Father, I'm going to pray and then I'm off. The Father resources you. The Father loves you. The Father believes in you. The Father resources you. I remember the first time we had a heart when I was 17 years old, just committed my life to Christ to do a mission with a guy called Eric Delve. And we put a little bucket at the end of the meeting. The mission cost £100. And we were like, then 17 years old, it's a lot of money, £100. Where's that going to come from? We just put a little bucket. We didn't make a big deal. And we said, put your money in. Guess how much money was in the bucket at the end of the evening? Me and my couple of mates. £100 God's provided. 1988, just before the credit crunch, there was a, a lot of fear around. And biz- Christian businesses even were going busted. And income was drying up for the message. And we had this season where we were thinking, wow, we're going to have to lay off staff, cut back programs. And I went to this conference in Portugal. And a guy called Mick Woodhead prophesied over me, Andy, God's going to give you a million pounds and a million opportunities. I'm like, well, praise the Lord. I've never had a a one-off gift like that ever in my life to the message. Well, only God can do that. And actually, in the UK, people don't give a million pounds, one-off, bosh. General funds, there it is, do with it as you, as you see fit. So I went home, well, please God, I could really do with some money, so I'm trusting you. But I also love the idea of a million opportunities to reach people for you. That was Thursday night in Portugal. Friday morning, I was having a, a breakfast meeting with a businessman in McDonald's. Shows how skint we were at the message at that point. And I went to see the guy, and I said, he said, how did the conference go? I said, oh, he said, it, I said, it was amazing, and I had this prophetic word from Mick Woodhead, this amazing man of God, said, God's going to give you a million pounds and a million opportunities. The guy went white. He said, I can't believe it. I just, just told my wife, we sold our business, and I'm going to give the message a million pounds. And, and when I set up this business, when I set up this business, I, I prayed, God, please will you allow me to write a million pound check to your work? So he wrote me a check for a million pounds, and and he gift-aided it. Gordon Brown gave me 260,000 pounds as well. Not me, but God's work. And it was like God saying, I'm for you. I'm your father. You just step out in my will, and I'll resource you. And, of course, we've blown that on mission. But what a glorious thing to blow your finances on. What a glorious thing to pour your heart on serving the living God because he's your father. And when he's your father, you're adopted into his family and you're co-heirs with Jesus. I'm done. Is it good news or what? I think there are some people here, you really need to know the love of the father. And the father, your father, maybe your father wasn't an abuser but he did neglect you. I I heard about a minister this week, Christian minister, who never heard his father call him by his name until he was 34 years of age. For his whole life, his father called him stupid number five because he was the fifth unwanted child. And it crushed him. So many of us feel like that, that rejection from our father. I'm telling you, you're not rejected by Father God. You're accepted. And I'm going to pray and then I'm going to get off. But I want you to stand to your feet if you want to know the love of the Father. You truly want to know the love of the Father. You've never really experienced that deep inside that you're loved. You're accepted. God believes in you. God wants to resource you for his purposes on earth and welcome you into heaven. I am going to be there because I'm a son of God. I don't deserve to be there. But the good news, people, is I won't look like this. I'll have hair, I'll have a six pack, and it'll kind of be Andy Hawthorne, but it won't be Andy Hawthorne, because it'll be the perfected me, and if I annoy any of you tonight, I won't annoy you on that day, 
because I'll be truly seen as a son of the living God. And if you came here tonight and you don't know God as your father, just get on your feet now and receive him. Receive him. Anyone who comes to me, there's no way I'll accept him. I'm just going to pray, Lord, I pray, I pray in this place for a fresh revelation of what it means to be a father. I pray young men and women tonight will accept you for the first time as father. They'll be adopted into your family. Thank you that you never say no to a humble, committed heart who wants to give you everything. I pray fresh salvation will spring up fresh revelation. We won't be held back by guilt and fear, but we'll go all out for you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for giving it all up for us so we can be your sons and daughters. Amen. Marvelous. Sit down. But if you did, particularly if that was the first time you've ever stood to your feet, to make a public commitment to Christ, make sure you talk to somebody who brought you, somebody from your church. And if you don't, if you came off the streets, you just came, what's going on here? Talk to somebody at the resources area, the speaker stand, they'd love to help you and give you materials to help you. Okay, it's my great pleasure now. Come on, let's give it up for the Lord. He's better than that. And there. Uh, are you going to, are you, are you taking that stand or you going to introduce this band, Seth? Yo, make some noise for my good friend Andy Hawthorne. <laughs>